Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. There's games in the Thar Hills. Welcome to July of 1982, where we were last in the arcades playing the phenomenal Joust. Why are we leaving the arcades? I don't want to leave the arcades. Let's just stay here and play Joust the whole time. No, it's time to dismount our bird and press forward and carry on. Our very next game is on the Apple II, and this is Neptune. Let's check out Neptune starting with the box. Neptune, illustration by Frank Carson. Every now and then you get the art direction or the artist on the front of these boxes. This is a computer software box, nicely done. Look at that, some sci-fi uh, underwater blasting possibly. Assembly language, you need 48K in your Apple II. Let's flip it over in the back. You're the commander in chief of the naval vessel Neptune. Your mission is seek and destroy enemy robot amphibians that have inhabited neutral waters in order to capture or destroy all friendly ships and vessels in the area. Wait a second. Enemy robot amphibians? Don't think we've heard that one before. The enemy mission is to undermine naval intelligence and take control of all neutral waters. You may counterattack these creatures by firing your powerful laser beams directly at them or by dropping your high explosive bombs on top as they try to maneuver, maneuver beneath you. Not all creatures can be destroyed with these weapons. You must pursue these robot creatures into caves. Be prepared to choose which opening of the caves to enter. There is only one way out. Good luck on a successful mission and a safe return. So basically, we're going to shoot everything up like we usually do. There's the objects we have. Have pupfish, jellyfish, octonians, sharkies, and then we have controls if you want to use the keyboard, but I think this is joystick control too. Spacebar, up, down, left, and right. We have a normal fire, a, a bomb, and then we have level of play is characterized by less maneuverability, changes in underwater environment, and aquatic life, and a faster pace. And they have hints. It's a fast action underwater game that requires an alert mind and quick thinking. We probably should find another game then. Let's see the other artwork we have for Neptune. Besides the front of the box, two different versions of it and what we saw on the back, we have the five and a quarter floppy disk. This is by Gabelli Software, not just published by Gabelli Software. This is developed by Nasir Gabelli, the Nasir Gabelli. It's time to pop it and play Neptune. It is July 18th, 1982. Let's see what Gabelli has up for us. What do you got for us, Nasir? We're always ready for something crazy. If it's by him, it's got to be pretty impressive. They gave us the point values when we start up. Oh, I gotta know those in 1982. <laughs> Maybe we will tonight, Victor. Maybe we will. All right, the game boots right when you push the button on your Apple II joystick, and you're in. I'm scrolling automatically to the right. It is another scramble variant. Home on the computer. We still haven't seen an official scramble. We have seen scramble spelled S-K. Not like, not like scrambling eggs, but on the VIC-20 they called it scramble with a K. And it wasn't official. But I have both modes of attack. The normal laser in front and then the bombs that fire behind. The scrolling's really good for the Apple II. Part of me feels like Nasir wasn't even trying that hard to make it happen. But look at the effect of the bubbles down below. That's pretty cool. In the arcade, this would have been a copy of Mariner or a Fathoms 800, depending on what region you were in. But as far as the game itself, it plays like I'm... Oh, interesting. It's using the joystick, kind of the sensitivity of the Apple II joystick, where I don't have to make extreme movements. I can do very slight changes to it, so it's nice. Oh, I gotta pay attention. Oh, you're gonna sink to the bottom. <laughs> if you let off the joystick, you will just sink straight down and crash into the side. Yeah, so far, with the Scramble re releases we played, we have some good ones, especially on the TRS-80. That one was called Strike Force. Check that one out down below. And then we also had um, Moon Raider on the Nazcom, if the Nazcom's more of your flavor. All right, let's so move on to the next round. My shots don't work. Oh, this is just maneuvering. What? The ship just went upside down? I did not mean to do that. But all I'm doing now is just holding steady. Hold the joystick steady. There you go. Did it just reverse the screen? Yeah, shots still don't work, so you're just supposed to maneuver to the next stage. It says we're still on level one, but fuel is going down. How about now? Nope, still got no shots. They've changed the controls up. The controls aren't as quick. I now am moving slower, and it feels like my control is more fine-tuned. So it's like a the, the asteroid section of Scramble where you're having to dodge everything. Oh, very cool. The, the How they changed up the controls is a nice touch. But we're still on level one. 
They don't call this another stage. If it wasn't the arcade, they call it a new phase or new stage. And I'm surviving for now. I don't know if I need to just hang on or move to the right. Wait a second, nothing hit me. Is the little shrapnel count? And do we have to start the whole thing all over again and dodge? It looks like we do, wow. So it looks like you can't touch any of the shrapnel on the outside. But as soon as we go into this phase, it changed, changes to a slower paced craft. Everything we're seeing here is supposed to be underwater. Changing up the game modes is such a nice touch. All right, I'm not going too far up there since I know those are gonna kill me. <laughs> oh man, you have to survive a long time. All right, going again. If I remember, if I knew that the pixels on the top left and bottom right were gonna hurt me, then I wouldn't go up there. Yeah, they make you want to go down there for safety, but you have to stay somewhere in the center and then dodge. You can tell a lot of time was put into this one to give you multiple game modes and changing the control up. So, so once again, Nasir Gabelli's done a very, very well done game on your home oh, computer. And this is only on the Apple II. Of course, you can get lots of scramble variants on other home computers, but you can't get Neptune anywhere else. Oh, there's the fuel. Quick. <laughs> Wait, what? I thought we were going to touch the... We don't we don't touch the fuel. How do you how do you get fuel then? Uh, I didn't have sh shots I could fire. All right, so we're back at the beginning. It looks like we start all the way over. There are no checkpoints. There there is no saving your progress. You lose. Good day, sir. It's really not that harsh. It shows you how to be a better gamer. How to play harder. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. If you're playing on the monochrome monitor, you wouldn't be able to see it, but you can, you gotta admit, scrolling horizontally like this is still really nice for the time. And on the Apple II, making the colors pop is kind of difficult. I'm surprised it still says level one down at the bottom, even though we pretty sure we got through three phases of the game. I wanted to see more if they go to the next level and if what the next level is. When we looked at the back of the box, it didn't boast that it had multiple game modes or anything. Okay, now we're going to the next phase. If it's not a level. I was going to take the high ground, but I was too late. And we are, our ship reverses, showing that we, we are underwater. The bubbles went away, though. Still have no shots. Right now, what you got? Okay, going into the next phase. I don't know what to do with the fuel though. I'll see if my shot works, but uh, <laughs> maybe we shoot the fuel or have to do something to the fuel. But whatever you do, don't touch the fuel. You'll you'll die. Oh my gosh! That was my fault, but I gotta admit it was really close. But I want to blame it on the hit detection. Nice and easy. It may have been a pixel that spawned on the outside. This takes so much focus. Because even though they slowed down your controls, moving the ship or maneuvering around takes a lot of concentration. Gosh. After going from a fast-paced scroller to this. Nice and easy. There we go. Yep, I think we got it. Come on. Quick, show us the end. Why is it taking so long? I don't think it took that long last time. Do I have any shots? No, laser and bombs are disabled again, so I got nothing to use except dodging. Maneuverability is where it's at. Alright, let's start throwing out some ratings now for Neptune. We, it does have multiple game modes. Would you consider this still an average game, around the three-star range? For all the games we've seen for the time? Or is this higher than average, above average, or an excellent game? Or is this, because we haven't seen too many really good scramble variants, is this one of the best video games you could play on a home computer? Oh gosh. It's so tricky. 
<laughs> oh, man. It's so hard. Yeah, I'm thinking four stars too, Mark, whenever I think of all the games we've seen so far. Oh, this is our last ship now, after I wasn't paying attention. This show is so hard to do on the, on the live sh on the live show. Uh, t t taking a look at chats. Oh, go, go. I don't know what I'm going to do when I get to the fuel anyway. Maybe they'll engage my bombs at the end of this. Um, by the way, take a look at the colors of the asteroids, if that's what they are. That is really, really good for the Apple II. Especially, look at the multicolored one. There's some magic trickery going on there. Oh, see, I'm pretty sure I could have dodged dodge that one. There we go. I got some three and a half thrown out there, too. Yeah, I want to keep playing to see further, and that's one of the best draws to games now, especially if they have different game modes. So Neptune by Nasir Gabelli is one of the very best scramble variants you could play at home so far. Uh, I'm going to say of all the games we've seen up to this point, um, Neptune is, let's see, <laughs> yeah, the jellyfish. Maybe that's what they are. I'm going I'm to say three and a half stars for Neptune. A very well done game uh, considering everything else we've seen so far on the home computer. All right, after Neptune, let's see where we're going now. After this commercial break. World War Yes, here we go. Seventeen bomber and IntelliVoice. With the IntelliVoice. Never in the history of video games had so many owed so much great gameplay. So few. The seventeen bomber and IntelliVoice from Mattel Electronics. Now get a free IntelliVoice module by mail when you buy. That's right. It is the release of B-17 Bomber for your Intellivision or B-17 Bomber. Let's take a look at the box for B-17 Bomber. This is the second release that Intellivision's let us hear voices in the game with Intellivoice. And it tells you right here on the box. It talks Intellivoice voice synthesis cartridge. B-17 Bomber. Let's see what the back has for us. A couple more screenshots, and if you didn't know, it talks. Yes, it does. Pick a target destination. The further away, the more points you can score, and over the target, you can bomb. It doesn't even tell you everything on the back of the box. But it's Europe, 1943. You control a B-17 Flying Fortress. Your mission, select a target of opportunity, fly to it, drop your bombs, and return safely to base. Enemy fighters try to swoop down on you and flak burst in the sky as you start your bomb run. The voices of your crew announce approaching fighter planes and targets as you play pilot, machine gunner, bombardier, and navigator. Keep on flying. Yes. And let's see what the other artwork we have for B-17 Bomber. We have the original and the cleaned up. Or reconstructed, if you will. And there's the overlay. We're going to slide over the controller on our Intellivision. You need to have all the pieces, but man, it does it so well. Like you got the gun placements and then your gauges, previews, and then switching from pilot to fly. Your bomb bay and then looking at the map. I really like this overlay. It's the one of the most helpful ones and makes sense. It works really good for B-17 Bomber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know Winston Churchill was doing commercials. So they got rid of George Plimpton and they got Winston Churchill to do the commercial. Nice touch. Way to go, Mattel. There's the cartridge we're going to pop in our Intellivision. And there is some actual flying fortresses. Oh, yeah. That's exactly what the game looks like. <laughs> Here's the manual for B-17 Bomber. It is a one-player game, but man, oh, man, it is a hell of a one-player game. In the last years of World War II, the Allied, the Allies preparing the biggest invasion in history across the English Channel. Fortress Europe waited from the North Sea of the Mediterranean. Countless air raids were flown over factories, airfields, refineries, warships. The USAAF B-17, together with the RAF Lancasters and Stirlings, took heavy explosives to key targets across Europe. The bombers met fighter planes and deadly flak. It took great teamwork and fast reflexes to complete each mission and get back to England. Now the computer lets you relive some of the heroic battles in the sky, or get PTSD if <laughs> you had family that was there. You can see over here on the left, this is the Intella voice module. You gotta play with it. You have to play with it. Why would you do it without voices? And then you have the cartridge for B-17 bomber you slide in. The object of the game is pick a target, fly to it. The voices of your fellow crew members are going to tell you when there's enemy fighters and flak appear. When you hear a bandit's position, move your machine gun where you can get a shot at the fighter, over the target, aim the bomb site, and release bombs. Watch your fuel level and don't stay too long. you got to get back to England to refuel, rearm, and repair your bomber. Fly as many missions as you can for the best game score. So they're still going for a score-based, not a mission-based game. But still... Still, this is allowing you to go pick the target you want, go out, fly, attack all the, uh, everything, and then do your bombing mission, and then get back to refuel. 
And over on the right side, we got the game controls. It is the usual affair on the Intellivision. Let's make it as complicated as possible. Look at how many controls that is. <laughs> it is insane. The side buttons perform three or sometimes four different tasks on what you can push. And then on the overlay, they got even more controls. This looks like a, a advanced uh, calculus algorithm that we're seeing. And then the disc, look, the disc performs four different things as well. Honestly, this looks too complicated. When you get into the game though, with the overlay, it's, it, it, it makes sense because you're going to be using the, the parts of the overlay and the buttons based on the situation you're in. All right. Next we have the controls, more controls in brief, giving you example of the map, Showing you, showing you where anti-aircraft batteries are, the airfield, the cursor that you can move around. It's a point uh, and select cursor. B-17 warship, and then shows you on your uh, the, the symbols that you're going to see on the map. If you need to load more bombs, if you how you need to take off and so forth. And then if you go to phase two, this is where you go into pilot mode and you fly your plane. It is a flight simulator, semi-flight simulator for the Intellivision. And then listen to your crew warnings because as you start to fly, they're going to tell you where aircraft's coming in. So this is the very first game where we have voice synthesis and you have to play with voice synthesis or you can't play the game. Voice synthesis is an integral part of this game and it's one of the first games to ever do that where they tell you where the enemies are and then you go in and uh, attack. It, it, it works so well. So we have the gauges to check where we are, our map, the con how, do we, how we control the plane, and then phase three is the bomb run. So you select on your uh, numpad the bomb and go to the bomb site, select your bombs and then bomb it up. When the game cartridge is inserted, a copy is going to appear that announces start the game and press the disc. So you just push your disc down and start playing the game. Then you preview what targets you want to go for. Industries, warships, AA guns, the airport. You pick out on the map and then you fly there. Move your cursor to any location and then push the action button to travel there. Then when you're ready for takeoff, look at the gauges to see assigned bomb load and fuel supply. After you've seen your gauges, then go to the top left action button. That lets you go to the flight simulator mode. And then from there, oh, actually it lets you, oh, you go to the left action button and it lets you add bombs to the, to the mission. Maximum load 17. And again, the computer subtracts an equal number of weight to keep the payload within the B-17's capacity. So just a little bit of simulation there, just a little bit. Enough to keep you engaged on the console. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, they did. I did not know that about Jimmy Stewart and Gene Roddenberry. So cool. All right, so as you approach, you can see the bomb bay doors, a straight down view of the bomb area. And then if you're in the pilot seat, you look like this in the bottom left corner, showing you the flight simulator. The pitch is on the screen, the uh, velocity and altitude is, is all there. And they do it without a user interface. It's done so well. And then over here on the have a navigation pane showing our position, which is the B-17 cursor on the map. And then when it's time to shoot down guns, you pick the 12 o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock or nine o'clock gun. And it looks like this screen, the one that has the planes that you can shoot down. And they make the, the the firing the guns really easy to, to pick up and play. So in a way, this is a slash simulation slash arcade game. Then we have the bombs away button. Putting any action button to bomb down on the ground. Get home safely. Your game continues until your plane crashes. Fly as many missions as you can. Save enough fuel for the return trip. If you're relatively high altitude, set pitch to fly in a, a slow descent. Reduce RPM to conserve fuel. Maintain at least 90 miles per hour airspeed to avoid stalling. If you need to jettison fuel to maintain speed, you press the top action button. So a lot of controls, as usual, on the Mattel and Television, but it works so well. And there's our points. Heavy score penalty if you bomb England. <laughs> Don't bomb England. Why would you do that? All right, let's pop it and play B-17 Bomber. Mattel Electronics presents B-17 Bomber. I couldn't have said it better myself. It's July 23rd, 1982. First thing we do is move the disc. And now I am freely moving my Mattel disc to go to the first bombing location. Let's go for right here. There. And now what we do is switch to our gauges view. Let's see what we got for supplies. So we have six bombs. Can we go higher? Oh, I meant to start the engine. Oh, go back. So we're back in flight simulator mode. Let's go. Take off, and we are flying. We got enough bombs for our mission, at least. And with the Intellivision disc, though, this honestly doesn't feel right. It feels like I should use a joystick. You know, the, like the Atari VCS joystick. So flying a flight simulator using the disc just feels a little strange. It feels much better to be holding a joystick. But um, you got to admit, look at the interface. It's showing us the pitch, altitude, and velocity all right here without a bunch of gauges. And the control is pretty simple. It feels really good. Now I need to know where we are, so let's switch to the map. 
and you can see our plane has left the top left dot in England and we have to fly across the channel to the right. So we're the cursor that's slowly moving across the channel. Let's go back to pilot mode. And you're doing all this on your controller, pushing the right buttons on your Intellivision. Let's speed this sucker up. We gotta get across. I'm gonna turn us a little bit to the side. For a flight simulator on a console though, wow. This is one of the best, and it's blended in with lots of other elements besides just a flight simulator. Part of me feels like it's a diet version of a flight simulator, but then part of me is amazed that this is on the console and plays the way it does. All right, let's go to the map. Let's see where we are. So we're crossing over the bottom right of England, going across the channel. So we should be in, yeah, over the ocean now. Looking good, sounding good, too. Yeah, I just saw in the chat, this is the Intella voice add-on module. I'd be curious to know if you could even play. Oh, see, got to hear what they say. Six o'clock. Go to the six o'clock. Here they go. Got him. And you go back to flight or pilot view, and we're still flying. Let's take a look. Okay, we're about to reach land, and you got to listen. You have to know what your gunners say to switch to those guns to fire. But notice how seamless it was. You switch to a gun, and then the, the, the way that you fire the gun, it just works so well. It's like video games should have been programmed this easy to begin with. There we go, so we're on land now. Can we raise this up? Nine o'clock, quick! Go, go, go! Got him. Oh, 12 o'clock, switching the guns. Got him. <laughs> oh, so cool. Okay, let's go to our map view. I, we're Fighter not over the... Nine o'clock. Watch out. <laughs> and they even tell you to watch out. Oh, missed him. Okay, where is he now? Twelve. Twelve o'clock. Yep, twelve o'clock. So look at the top right of the screen. The more inaccurate shots Got you have, them. the lower your score is going to go. All right, I think we're here. Can we bomb? Fighters three o'clock. Oh, got fighters three o'clock. No time Lock to bomb out. now. There we go. Got him. Okay, switch back to bombing mode. Let's find the target. Nine oh, back to nine o'clock. Guns, Lock switch it out. out. It's a game that gives you lots of jobs to do. Ben, you have six o'clock. Watch, Watch out for the flak. Got him. Switch back to bombing mode. Fighters, three o'clock. Three o'clock. Man, they're everywhere. Look out. <laughs> there he is. Oh, no. He got us. Check on inside. Bandit, <laughs> six o'clock. Okay, six o'clock. Here we go. Out. Missed him. Go up Fighters, to 12. Three o'clock. Oh, three o'clock. Uh oh. Looks like our guns are down on the three o'clock side. Let's go to twelve o'clock. Are they coming back? Yeah, they're coming around to the bad side. So what you have to do is turn to pilot mode and turn to face that side. Oh, they're gonna keep getting. Fighters, six o'clock. Okay, six o'clock. Go, go, go. There we go. Got it. Fighters, three o'clock. Three o'clock. Can't take them out because the guns are down. Can we go to status? Fighters Shows us our uh, information Bandit and damage there. So I can also turn the ship because I think, where are we now? Yeah, we're now flying over the area. Bandit, Six o'clock. Nine o'clock. Watch them. So not only is the voice manager making it feel like we have people on our plane with us, helping us, it is essential to have because it's telling us where to turn to fire off Fighters on the guns. Look out. It is a gameplay feature. It is it is enhancing the gameplay to have the voice to a Fighters whole nother level. <laughs> I want to hear Slim Pickens again. 
Oh, he doesn't say it over here. Oh. Yeah, I think we're not over the, the target now. Look out for flag. Three o'clock. Oh, going three o'clock. We can't shoot him. <laughs> Sounds like we have a team of people with us on the plane. So cool. All right, going six o'clock. Look out. Lead it. Oh, no. Nine. Go, go, go. Thought I heard him. I don't see him now. Oh, there he is. Go. <laughs> Then, three oh, three o'clock still down. Watch so you can abandon it, go to your pilot mode, and fly away. You can see we're still over the area, but gotta take out uh, the other enemy aircraft. Fighters, twelve o'clock. All right, going in twelve o'clock guns. Where's he at? There he is, coming up. Oh, they're getting hits on us. Got him. Flag. I got Bend some flag. Three o'clock. They keep it in our three o'clock uh -oh. side. They know that this that side's down. <laughs> Fighters, twelve o'clock. Can we pick a different bombing? Yeah, we can pick a different bomb here and then go fly to a different spot. Yeah, it's a really intense game. This is another title that uh, is really pushing what consoles can do, and it's almost like a game that tells you this is something that should, should, we should have been playing something this good already. Uh, B-17 Bomber, while I was playing a, a quick example of how it works, when you go and actually bomb down on the, the land and then make your way back to England, refuel and so forth, and just keep going back and forth for the points, that is a, a, an amazing experience. B-17 Bomber is such a good game that I wouldn't be surprised if this was selling in televisions. It is only on the Intellivision, so this is nowhere else. Oh, that's right, yep. Yeah, that was your warning to let you know about the bombs. Yeah, checkpoint in sight. There's also so much talking that helps you in the game. Um, we've only seen like a few snippets of what the IntelliVoice has done, but this one pushes it to another level, and this is the second game for the IntelliVoice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the voice really makes the game. I'm going to crank it up all the way. I'm going to say of all the games we played on any game for a home console, this is one of the best ones you could play. So I'm going to say B-17 Bomber is way up there. I'm going to go five stars as... For all the console games so far, this one pushes the envelope of what you can do for a game. It is only one player, but it's a really good game, a really fun ride. And uh, incorporating elements of simulation and uh, arcade all into one package. It is the full package. Awesome. Yeah, I see them four and a halfs and fives. Yeah, the depth is the other thing too. It makes it seem simple, like this would be just easy to have a video game like this. But no, we haven't seen a game that does all this. All right. After B-17 Bomber, let's see what our next game is. We're now on the Apple II, and this is Dnieper River Line. Another one by Avalon Hill. Let's take a look at the box for Dnieper River Line. After Stalingrad, after Kursk, comes the Dnieper River Line. Another one by Microcomputer Games. Let's flip it over on the back. This is the cassette version. This is the Dnieper River Line, a computer game that depicts a fictionalized engagement between the Russian and German forces in the southern Ukraine, using it as a historical basis of the Soviet thrust over the Dnieper River in, the, in late 1943. The game challenges you, the German player, to repel Russian efforts to breach this critical defensive position. So in other words, this is not a historically accurate game. This is based on uh, events around World War II, but it's not really uh, taking into account that it's making up a fictionalized uh, version of it. All right, so after we, we're not going to read the entire back of the box, but this is another one of those massive war games that you can uh, dive in. But it, this one's also one of the l very last computer slash board game hybrids. Uh, coming up later, we have another one of the last ones, which is called Close Assault by Avalon Hill. But uh, this one is you can't really play unless you have the board game, too. Let's take a look at the artwork for Dnieper Riverline. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the rest of the chat. It, it's it's one of the best ones we've seen on a console. Here we go. So as far as the box, we have the advertising you would have seen in magazines at the time with controller, Galaxy, Guns of Fort Defiance, Voyager, Computer Baseball Strategy, most of the ones we see by Microcomputer Games. Inside the box is the map. You have to have this map. You're going to be taking pieces that are inside the box and using the pieces on the map. So you are not just playing a computer game. It is a board game, too. Really nice map, though. 
I remember seeing reviews that this is one of the reasons people got it is just because how cool and how good the map looks. Inside the box is also all the pieces you'd be punching out of the cards. There they are. Your armor, your infantry, all the different units. And we also have the, uh, the, the cheat sheet or reference card, if you will, showing you all the different units and then the commands. With some more pieces to cut, <laughs> so much you'd be popping out to play the game. And if it's German occupied or Russian captured. And then this is also part of the Avalon Hill catalog that was inside the box. Of how do you can order more games by Avalon Hill? Tell us more with the, the registration card. And this one I got from Wargaming Scribe, breaking down what the commands you enter. Because it's asking you to give orders to units, unit status, call reserve, artillery, objective stats. And all this is the manual, but man, there's a lot you have to remember. And you'll be referring back to the manual because this game isn't just played on a board with pieces. And it's not played with just a manual. It's also played with a notebook. You have to have a notebook, a board game, a manual, and a computer all at the same time. There's the, the cassette we're going to pop in to play, Dnieper River. And there it is, the full set of everything you'd have complete in box to play Dnieper River Line. This is a war game I can't do justice because I don't have a board game in front of me. You have to have that to play. Let's take a look at the manual for Dnieper River Line. All those war game aficionados are drooling now. All right. This tells you about the complicated German situation and Russian capabilities, such as you can do air attacks, artillery barrages, partisan paratroop attacks, unknown Soviet objectives, and the DRL establishes the game situation, determining which uh, Russian force objective you're going to have and then what your main objectives are for the game. This isn't as insane as our last war game we saw, but this one, because SSI is still the king of war games, but this is uh, one of the last board games slash computer games. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's true. Those pieces, I'm sure, were lost unless you were the hardcore board gamer. All right. So they break down first the setup, which you're going to be doing the first part of the game is in the computer. Whatever you input for coordinates, you have to take your little pieces and put them on the map. After you place all your German units, then the computer tells you where their pieces are going to go. And so while it's reading off the information, you're setting all your pieces down on the board. After the game's initialized, then you go to the status report. If, give an explanation of terms of what they all mean to the game because everything's abbreviated. It is all text that you're going to see. That's correct. Nothing is graphic on this game. And the gameplay consists of five phases, the Russian movement phase, the Russian combat phase, the German movement phase, the German combat phase, and the reinforcement phase. Is anybody else there? Is anyone here? If you're still here, then you're probably a war gamer because everyone else has left the building. We just went from an extreme arcade action game to this. This is a whole new world. There we go, what all the abbreviations stand for. And I'm not going to go through the entire manual, but this is another very lengthy time to set up, prepare to play a, a, a war game at the time. All right, let's pop in and play Dnieper Riverline by Avalon Hill near the end of July 1982. So this one, I'm going to have to cheese a little bit. I'm not going to be able to give you the full experience. I recommend checking the links down below for Wargaming Scribe and his website because he goes into all the depth and everything you would need to know about Dnieper Riverline. Microcomputer games. Avalon Hill doing what they do best. Strategy games. War games trying to take all the board gamers to the computer. They've actually been helpful. We would have had this bigger split between board game and computer game for a lot longer time, but thanks to the acts of this, it didn't take as long. Looks like I'm gonna have to speed it up, right? We don't have time to wait for all the loading. <laughs> yes, that's right, he does. All right, so we're gonna start with the easiest difficulty level, Lieutenant. I'm not going any crazier than that. Our tongue commander, you've been given five fine Wehrmacht units to defend the Dnieper River line. Five units from, oh, I guess we're not reading, or we didn't read fast enough. <laughs> so the game always starts with a roll of the dice, gives you random units and their, their, their stats. Do you wish to accept this order of battle? Yes, yes, we do. Unit one is an FJ infantry, units 95%, and now we take our little pieces and we put them on the map. So you're humming to yourself the Battle Hymn of the Republic as you put your coordinates in, and then you take that little piece. Oh, you also got to say if it's mobile. I'm going to say mobile, static, or assault. You take that little piece, you put it down on your board, and then you go to the next unit. And that's what you do. The very beginning of the game is all this setup. What do we want to do now? We're going to put them in coordinate one, three. I'll make this one stat. Uh, wait, static. And then put them down on the board. And you're just taking your little pieces, 
put them on the board, matching up with the computer says, which means if you make a mistake and put it on the wrong place, you're going to just screw the whole game up. You got to do all of it. We'll make that one assault. Let's make this one on one five, make a mobile. Isn't this setup fun? If you were a war gamer, you'd be salivating right now. I'm about to play the coolest war game. And now it breaks down where all the other people, uh, oh, we're gonna put our mines. Okay, so let's do mine location. Let's do one eight. And then, so we, now we're laying all the mines, which again are the little pieces on your board. Let's put that one down there. Oh, wait, no, I went uh, one. Uh, Re-enter one nine there. And then the next one, I'll put four down on two five there and we got 16 left gosh okay i'll do five more mines on three two and then 11 remain can we do 11 on three three it almost feels like i'm doing a really complicated version of stratego <laughs> taking the pieces and putting them in different places but here's the thing about Nipa river line it's one player you're playing against that cheating computer and you know they're cheating you cannot play against a human player. It is only one player against the computer. All right, so uh, garrison companies have been gathered to assist in the defense. Number of garrisons have been assigned to the defense of Rogachev. Okay, we want to do one. And number assigned to the defense of Zoblin, we'll do two. Number assigned to Bobrusk, let's do three. And defense reg uh, headquarters, let's do one. And Rata Airfield, one. Defense of Parichi, one. And so you're assigning all your garrisons. And again, all those pieces that we just cut out are all going on the board. <laughs> we have shown an image of the board. I do not have the board itself with me. So the game is initialized. Press return. The time is 400 hours. Artillery barrage begins. And now, quick, take your pieces. Where's the uh, Russian movements use moving? Russian infantry advancing. Breaking up, showing you the quadrants where they are there at 0, 10. And so you're taking little pieces and you're moving them around on the board while it happens. It's a turn-based strategy game, but you still have to be moving everything on the board because there's no graphics. Everything you see is going to be text. And now it's doing the calculations of what Russia is doing after their artillery barrage. <laughs> Alright, we'll stop there. I've wet my whistle enough of how to play a strategy game of Dnieper River Line. Now, I will tell you that while we didn't play a full experience, this game, based on ratings at the time, was slightly better than uh, some of the other war games, but it's still subpar considering the other games you could be playing on a home computer. I will say this game is just a smidge above Tanktics, if you saw that, uh, the, the, the game we played previously but i'm still going to say this is a, a sub average game considering all the other games you could play two and a half stars for a neeper river line yes it is old school though it's almost like you're getting a, a taste of what it was like to play with just the board game not a computer game but that's not all neeper river line was also for the atari home computer that's right you can play on either one Apple II or the Atari home computer. Well, actually, it's Avalon Hill. Avalon Hill is like Scott Adams. They want their computer, their, their games on every computer possible. So here you go. Let's take a, a quick look at Dnieper Riverline. They package the box with all the same goodies inside. You have the advertisement. There's the map of everything, where all your pieces are going to go. There's everything that came in the box. Your reference card, the catalog, your registration, and the cassette to play some Dnieper River Line. The manual is the same as we saw before. It's the fictionalized engagement between Russian and German forces in Belarus. Using its historical basis, the Soviet thrust against the Dnieper River in late 1943, DRL challenges the German player representing Army Group South to repel the Russian efforts to breach this critical defensive position. Soviet units controlled by the computer seek to overrun the German defensive line and capture sufficient centers of resistance to assure victory. <gasps> if that doesn't get you excited, you probably should pick another game. Let's pop in and play Dnieper River Line for the Atari home computer. It is July 29th, 1982. This is Bruce Ketledge that did this one. <laughs> it probably could now if we wanted to play on a, uh, on a calculator. I would feel we've already played strategy games that give you maps that have hex grids. SSI has been pushing further than these kinds of games. This feels like a product of something we would have played in the 70s rather than right now in 1982. And I have had sources that say Dnieper Riverline was released closer to January or February 1982. 
but it's so old, it's split in hairs trying to find the exact release dates of these games. Okay, let's go. We want to be lieutenant because we're not crazy here. And Atong Commander, you've been given five fine Rookmark units to defend the Dnieper River line. Eight units from Army Group South are in reserve. Here are the forces available. And then they randomize our forces. They give us all of our pieces. Do you want to accept? Yes, we do. And now the fun begins. All the setup. Take your pieces, put them on the board. And remember, all you're seeing is text. There is no graphics. That's it. And that's all I'm going to show this. We already played Dnieper River line on the Apple II. And that's all I can stomach. I'm still going to say, just like the Apple II, this is a subpar game. Two and a half stars if you think of all the other games you could play on a home computer. Not even just strategy or war games only. Yes, basic. <laughs> yes, it is. All right. And with that, after the war games, what's next? It's time to go to Japan and play Avenger for the Commodore Max Machine. We are all over the grid here. Let's take a look at the box for Avenger with an actual scan of Avenger. If this looks familiar, we've already played this on the VIC-20. So this is a remastered re-release for the, the fresh Commodore Max machine. Let's flip it over on the back. Oh yeah, there we go. Get that sweet, sweet Japanese in there. And this grid, by the way, is giving me lots of Sega Master System vibes way before the Sega Master System. Pretty cool. It's also known as Avengers, so it could be either one or the other. Okay, so after the box, we also have the cartridge we're going to pop in, because the Commodore Max machine primarily used cartridges, similar to the VIC-20, but this was almost all cartridge, not mixing it up like the VIC-20 did. Let's take a look at the manual for Avenger, or Avengers. They give us a screenshot. If you remember on the VIC-20, this is Space Invaders, or a way to play Space Invaders. How do we play? Well, first you get your machine, you make sure the power is turned off, you plug it in, and you learn how to read Japanese. Oh, there we go. Plug in everything to the RF modulator. Yes, powered on. Get your joystick or paddles into your Max machine. And then, what is this? Oh, look at that. Is that a Commodore 64? <laughs> Did they get Commodore 64s early or something? I was pretty sure that's August when we see that. Did Japan get the Commodore 64 before us? And then they break down the screen, what everything means. Very nice touch. Telling you the controls on the keyboard, but we're going to play with our Commodore Max Machine joystick. Looks very similar to the VIC-20 joystick. Uh, actually, no, it doesn't look quite... It looks kind of like the VIC-20. And then they tell you what the point values are, because you got to know what the points are, even in Japan. From Commodore Japan Limited. This one has two versions, one that was in Japan only, and then the Commodore Max Machine, I didn't think it was in other regions, but I got a USA Europe version too. Let's pop in and play Avenger by Commodore Business Machines at the end of July 1982. <laughs> I never understood the grid marks either, why they did that in North America. We're going to be seeing both here on the channel, the Sega Mark III and the Commodore uh, uh, Master System, and the artwork on the Mark III is arguably way better. What they did in Japan is, is a lot better. All right, here we go. I'm ready to play. Push the button, and that's all you got to do. Don't even have to touch the keyboard, and we're in. Ready to play some Avenger. What's that? Space Invaders? No. No, it's Avenger, obviously. Space Invaders was so big in Japan that the arcades that were in 1978 would call themselves just Space Invader Houses. They, they were they made just Space Invader games. If you if you haven't seen the links that we have down below, we've been playing Space Invader clone after Space Invader clone, and the arcades were full of just small variants or nuances to Space Invaders. So this game wouldn't be fooling anybody in Japan. They would know exactly what they're playing. They would not even probably call this Avenger or Avengers. They would just call it Space Invaders. They even have the color change of the aliens as they get closer, which is a nice touch. This feels like I'm going back to the 70s and playing me some Space Invaders. It plays and feels just like it. You could say it's got a slightly higher resolution than the VIC-20, but it's not doing that much more. But this is a very accurate home version of Space Invaders. 
But for a home computer, I mean, we've already played some really good ones. Just time those shots, get it in there. Show no mercy. Come here, buddy. What? There we go. <laughs> All right, there we go. It's Space Invaders, or Avenger, on the Commodore Max machine. Okay, so now, are you going to be heartless like me and say, Space Invaders is old news? This is subpar, considering the other games we've seen. Or are you going to be more of a classic aficionado and say, this is a, not just an average game, it's a very well-done Space Invaders game. It should be a higher-rated game. I'm going to say, similar to the Commodore VIC-20 version, it's uh, exactly like Space Invaders. It's well-done Space Invaders, but it is one player... Oh, I'm sorry, it's two-player, but it's alternate play. You can't combine forces like you do on the, on the system. Yeah, I see the two-and-a-half stars, and I am with you, scruffy-looking 21. Two-and-a-half as well, just like on the Commodore VIC-20. And that's not the end of Avenger, too. We're going to see when it comes out on the Commodore 64 and other Commodore systems. It just doesn't go away. It is one of the classic shooters that uh, people were clamoring for in Japan. All right. Yeah, I've seen two-and-a-half all around so far. <laughs> All right, let's see our next game. Moving back to the Apple II, this is Frazzle. Frazzle Dazzle. Let's take a look at Frazzle. The artwork we have for it is the magazine ad. You're trapped in a force field with them. Alien beasties have surrounded your Frazzle ship with impenetrable force field, and they're closing in on all sides. As the beasties zoom in to attack, you monitor them on your radar screen. Your only chance is to drop energy probes in their path and dissolve them on impact. Make your Frazzle ship speed up slow down and turn on the dime to avoid fatal collisions with beasties and your ammunition and force field around you futuristic fantasy from muse software yeah we love muse software 24.95 is what it says here i'll take it now that's it as far as artwork goes let's pop in and play frazzle by jc nolan published by muse software at the end of july 1982. <laughs> manly that is true you could just consider it the bone uh, edge of average. Oh, I'm prepared, all right. I'm prepared to play, play some Frazzle, whatever that is. There we go, Muse Software. All right, so one thing you got to know about Frazzle is it says two players, but it's alternate play. The other thing is this is not joystick controlled. It's keyboard only. So I'm going to do a one-player game. Oh, it's doing a track mode. Oh, nice touch. Look at that. So even though it is keyboard controlled only, the controls are very simple. You have one button to turn your ship 90 degrees. You have one button to make your ship increase speed and one bit button to make your ship decrease speed. Every time you hit the increase speed button, it goes faster and stays that way until you downgrade the button. All right, can I get in this? Anything? There we go. One player. Here we go. All right, so I'll show you by moving out of the way. This is me doing the one button. That's all I can do to move my ship around. And whenever I want to go faster, I push the... Let's see, if I push the go button, it's going to go this fast. If I push it again, it'll go faster. If I push it again, it'll go faster. And then if I want to slow down, I have to hit the slow down button that many a times to slow down. It is clunky. Clunky as all get out to move around. At first you think, whoa, it looks like asteroids. It's a blown up asteroid ship. No, there's no gravity. There's no asteroid ship. It's this one screen with limited controls. All right, so after you figure out that you realize what the controls are doing, then the next section, or the next phase of the game is blowing up these these bo uh, balls that are going around by dropping bombs. You want to drop the bombs in a particular spot to get them to hit them. Let's keep going up here. And slow us down. Stop. Nope. Turn. <laughs> it's, it's really, really clunky. And then whenever you die, well, you start over at the beginning. Okay. But drop those bombs. Turn us around, go this way. This time, let's get some more bombs right here. Uh, I don't think that'll work. You can hit your own bombs too, so watch out. Oh, so you have to avoid those those bombs and the ones that you drop. They start you off in a, tr in a really tricky spot, but honestly, what's holding the game down is the controls. Why didn't they control it with a joystick or program it to work with a joystick. All right, so let's go this way and draw one and then two and then three. So the bombs that are bouncing around, they follow a pattern. You have to kind of memorize what the pattern is. Let's go there, drop a few here and you have 
unlimited number of bombs to drop, but you can't drop them all at once. So eventually, whenever they run out, you have to wait for them to clear away before you can do anything about it. Going down there. Yeah, this goes in the, the category of a cool idea for a game, but the execution is poop. It's just terrible. But I like the idea. We This is a, a unique idea. We haven't seen this kind of style of a game. Moving around, dropping bombs in a certain place to clear everything away. And you can see once they're all clear, then it moves on to the next one. They, they start spawning in a different area. Nice, got them out. Let's go up here. I think they're going to bounce and hit these ones. Let's see. Get them. Yeah, there we go. So you can keep the ship moving at a brisk pace. You just have to remember that you can only move one way uh, or one uh, angle at a time. If you wanted to give it a big stretch, it could be considered a puzzle game, but it's not even a shooter. It's a, it's a drop bombs game. And the learning curve is just too steep. It takes a while to get used to. There we go. And I think we got a good pattern here. I'll just keep looping around this circle and then hoping they hit the bombs I drop. Let's see. Go there. Come on. You can do it. Come on. Hit one. Yeah. There we go. And I think, am I trapped here? I can only turn left. All right. So I'm going to sneak down here since no one... I'll just go right there, drop one. Nice, there we go. And there we go, it continues to repeat, and this is the game. So what you see is here. Uh, while the controls are difficult, it it is not a bad game. I, I commend it for what it's done, but it isn't doing anything. Um, uh, it, it should have been executed better. <laughs> All right, throw those ratings out now for Frazzle, a game I was not familiar with before this show. <laughs> oh, I'm seeing Brokens out there already. Two, no, we can't go diagonal. It's only 90 degree turns, and that's all we got for Frazzle. So I'm going to say it is a subpar experience just because of the controls. The idea is pretty good, and you can keep the ship moving and then turning at the right time, but it just it, it's too clunky. Too clunky to get anything higher than that. I don't want to say it's bad, though, because if you had this game on the Apple II, it, it, you wouldn't think of it as a bad title. It would still be some enjoyment. It is original, too, that's for sure. All right. And let's go to our next game. It's time to hit the arcades and play some Funky B. I have no idea what Funky B is. We're going to find out. As far as artwork, we have a reconstructed one. This is by Orca Corporation with a reconstructed cabinet. cabinet not even a real, real cabinet. Is this a real game? There's the control panel. This is on an eight-way joystick and fire. Two players can alternate, and we have an example of the screenshot. All right. For different versions, we have a harder bootleg version or the one that was in Japan. Let's go to Japan and play Funky B by Orca at the end of July, 1982. Oh man, <laughs> the, the homemade artwork. This, this is not what you found in the cabin, I'm sure. All right, let's go, push and start. We are in, I'm gonna lower that down. It feels like it's too loud. Okay, so it's a vertically scrolling shoot up. Look at this. We even have music playing in the background. Wow, now presentation wise, this is pretty cool considering we haven't seen Xevious yet that may really popularize this. We've already seen some vertically scrolling shooters like this. But uh, I would say the colors though are uh, very reminiscent of later shooters, not anything we've seen so far. Plus we have this music playing in the background. The most bizarre thing, though, is this is the very first example of any shooter to be a cute em up This might be one of the first cute em ups where we're not flying uh, planes and destroying things. We had another example of one that used um, insects that was looking colorful. You could call Centipede a cute em up too, if you wanted to, since it has the colors. But I mean, look at this. We're playing as a, a bee flying around and, wait a second, I'm actually pollinating the flowers which slows down the gameplay. Look, when I pass over a flower, it slows the scroll down and gives me the points. So there's no button to be pushed. All it is is just moving over the flower and you get points for them. 
but that slows down the shooting. So you're half pollinating flowers, you're half shooting. I have to know if this was released in Europe or other regions besides Japan. But it allowed us to put our initials in. This makes no sense. Why is there a dolphin on the front of Funky Bee? <laughs> is it a dolphin or a bee? All right, let's go in again. Despite my best wishes. Yeah, the bee is holding what looks like a harpoon and then it fires in front. I can only fire one bu bullet at a time, similar to Space Invaders. So when it makes contact, then it allows me to fire again. But um, what a bizarre concept of slowing down the screen when you move across the flower to pollinate. So weird. It's also not giving me any indication that we're going to see something else, like another screen or section. To tell you the truth, this game could have been made on a home computer just as well. I could, I could very easily see this on the Atari home computer because of the way the, the colors are, the scrolling, and the simplicity of the mechanics of flying. Look, I, I can move a little bit around, but I move really, really slow. That's right, the attract mode did show another screen, so maybe there is more if you get far enough. The insects that I'm shooting, their patterns are very erratic. Or I haven't figured out the yeah I haven't figured out the, how how they move around. God, we had game over already. No high score now. I'm on the fence with this one. It feels like this game should be coming after Xevious. Having the elements down below on the ground. We're not bombing flowers, but the, and the, but on the other side, I think that this is. A little too clunky, gameplay-wise, firing one shot at a time. Gosh, those patterns drive me nuts. <laughs> yes, I dare you, Victor. <laughs> oh, the gameplay. So maybe there's other screens later on, but um, I'd be hard-pressed to see if you can get past the insects flying in these patterns. For all the arcade games we've seen so far, it's definitely not average. I'm going to be uh, going higher considering the other ones. What was that? And then the insect stops. It looks like it's about to do the tractor beam from Galaga and then just flies right at me. So it does take a little bit of time to get used to the, the insects, but just bear in mind, in the arcade, this kind of scrolling raster a shooter it is very, very rare. I don't think I think we've only played two other games that do this. The rest of them do a pseudo scroll, where they're scrolling maybe a few star fields in the background or some rocks on the side to give you the illusion that you're flying or, or, or uh, scrolling vertically. This one's doing an actual play field, scrolling it uh, to the top. So still pretty impressive. Oh yeah. It's just weird to call it average because it's not average as far as uh, the games you could see in the arcades and play. And it's just so bizarre because it gives me vibes that it's, it's Xevious, but Xevious doesn't exist yet. All right, so for Funky B, uh, going to the arcade in Japan, I could see a few people wanting to play this and realizing that the controls aren't super sharp or refined, so it's not as fun as uh, other shooters you could play. Um, we've played Galaga, which is the newest, hottest, coolest, like, space shooter, and that one's so polished. It feels really good to, 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 to control. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Funky 4 from Mark. Yeah, you would have played it. Well, uh, I can see by the, by the look of the game uh, for that. I'm going to say three and a half stars. Uh, it's not an average game. It's, it's an above average game, but um, it doesn't have as much polish as other arcade games we've seen. All right, what a bizarre way to end the evening. There you go, that's Funky B. So if you could go back to 1982, how would you rate all these games on our five-star rating scale? Tell me in the comments down below. Come for the live show. Thanks, everyone, for coming to this live show. Next episode is a very special one. It is the anniversary of Chronologically Gaming. I got a really special episode lined up for everybody. That's it for today, and like I always say, I'll throw you the idol, but you'd better throw me that whip first.
Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central, so join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.